Wait! You may be wondering why the red suit. Well, that's so bad guys can't see me bleed. This guy's got the right idea. He wore the brown pants. Cue the music. In a world overflowing with movies, we need a hero. Someone to separate the bad from the good. Hi everyone, I'm Em and welcome to Verbal Diorama episode 102, Deadpool. This is the podcast that's all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. A huge hi and welcome to all of you, whether you're a returning listener or just a huge fan of Deadpool and or Ryan Reynolds and let's be honest, who isn't? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so, so much for all the incredibly positive feedback on the recent Avengers four-parter. That was a huge task for me. It took so much out of me, actually, to do those episodes. But, you know, go big or go home for the 100th episode. And, obviously, this is episode 102. This episode was always going to be 101. And then the room kind of worked its way in there. And so this then became 102. But it was always my plan to kind of hit you all with Deadpool straight after Avengers Endgame. And you might be asking why. Because... I try and avoid doing superhero movies back to back unless it's like a quadrilogy in the example of the Avengers. But I kind of thought to myself that Deadpool would be the sort of character who would want to take part in Avengers Endgame. And I feel very much like if Deadpool 3 doesn't start with Dopinda driving Deadpool to this huge battle with Thanos only for it to be over by the time he arrives, then Marvel Studios are missing a huge trick. Because I feel like that would genuinely happen. Because let's be honest, Deadpool, he has decent intentions, but things just don't really work out for him. So I will give you that idea for free, Kevin Feige. And I also wonder very much, if Deadpool met Thanos, would he immediately see Cable? Or Josh Brolin? I expect he would. So I just really like the idea of doing Deadpool straight after Avengers Endgame. And then the room came in. Uh, but it's fine. Things happen. Things change. My plans change. I do plan quite a lot for this podcast, but I am happy for plans to change. And I'm so delighted with the episode on the room. It was such fun to do. It was so amazing to chat to Greg Sestero. It was so lovely to do an AMA and just get loads of people asking me wonderful questions. So, yeah, I'm delighted with The Room, delighted with Avengers, and I'm delighted to do Deadpool as well. I will add as well that I did extend an invitation to Deadpool to appear on this episode, but he couldn't guarantee that his appearance would be PG-13. And I am a family-friendly podcast. But this is not an especially family-friendly movie. And it's going to be quite interesting, I think, <laughs> how I deal with that. I don't do bad language. I don't do violence or scenes of a sexual nature. But Deadpool does all of those things. And to be honest, I am absolutely f***ing delighted that Deadpool does all of those things. So here is the very R-rated Merc with a Mouth with a very... PG-13 version of the trailer, obviously. I love you, Wade Wilson. We can fight this. You're right. The cancer's only in my liver, lungs, prostate, and brain. It's all things I can live without. What if I told you we can make you better? You're a fighter. We can give you abilities most men only dream of. Make you a superhero. You just promise you'll do right by me, so I can do right by someone else. And please don't make the super suit green or animated. One thing that never survives this place is a sense of humor. Uh, we'll see about that, Posh Spice. Oh, come on. You gonna leave me all alone here with less angry Rosie O'Donnell? Hey, yeah, I wanna shoot, baby. Stacks, 
pussy in the back, brother. I wanna thank your mother for a butt like that. Yo, shotgun. Bang! What the fuck that is bang? I wanna know, how does it hang? You may be wondering why the red suit. Well, that's so bad guys can't see me bleed. This guy's got the right idea. He wore the brown pants. Cue the music. X go give it to you. Wait ah! for you to get it. What the? Oh, X go deliver to you. Ah! Red with the enemy. No matter how many caps I break, red with a black enemy. Reeks like old lady pants in here. Why such a douche this morning? Oh. God, you are hard to look at. You look like the topographical map of Utah. Exactly. I am very turned on right now. You are haunting. You look like an avocado had sex with an older avocado. Thank you. Greetings, munchkins. Did you like that dose of green band goodness? Hankering for a little more action? Some big boy curse words, maybe? Check out DeadpoolWebsite.com for my red band trailer. Make sure to ask your mommy and tell her to call me. She's got the number. After being diagnosed with terminal cancer on the same day his girlfriend accepts his marriage proposal, Former Special Ops agent Wade Wilson is approached by a shady organisation offering a cure to his cancer. Wade accepts and meets psychopath Ajax, actually Francis Freeman, who injects Wade with a strange serum, supposedly the cure to his cancer. Francis, along with his assistant Angel Dust, proceed to put Wade through unbearable torture, leaving him with horrible burn-like scars over his entire body and an accelerated healing factor. But Wade doesn't forget, because he's very annoyed and he wants his beautiful face back to normal. Armed with two katanas, pistols and a red suit and mask, Wade becomes Deadpool and makes it his mission to hunt Francis down and get revenge. Right, casting characters of some douchebags film. God's Perfect Idiot as Wade Wilson, aka Deadpool. A hot chick as Vanessa. A British villain as Francis Freeman, aka Ajax. The Comic Relief as Weasel. A moody teen as Negasonic Teenage Warhead. A CGI character as Colossus. A gratuitous cameo as Strip Club DJ. This movie was produced by Ass Hats. It was written by the real heroes here. It was directed by an overpaid tool with special thanks with tongue to Rob Liefeld and Fabian Nicisa. But I'm not as funny as Deadpool, unfortunately, and I will freely admit that I'm not as funny and or wisecracking as Deadpool. So here are the actual credits for the movie. They are Ryan Reynolds as Wade Wilson, a.k.a. Deadpool, Marina Bakarin as Vanessa, Ed Skrine as Francis Freeman, a.k.a. Ajax, TJ Miller as Weasel, Gina Carano as Angel Dust, Brianna Hildebrand as Negasonic Teenage Warhead, Stefan Kapicic as Colossus, Leslie Uggams as Blind Al, Karen Sony as Dopinda, and Stan Lee as Strip Club DJ. It was actually produced by Simon Kimberg, Ryan Reynolds and Lauren Shuler Donner. It was written by Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, directed by Tim Miller and based on Deadpool by Rob Liefeld and Fabian Nicisa. And apologies if I pronounced any of those names incorrectly. So, Deadpool. Well, how do you start talking about Deadpool? Because Deadpool stands alone, really, in comic book history. He's had an almost 30 year run of being a huge sensation almost fading into oblivion and then becoming a cult favourite character. He's completely self-aware. He knows he's a fictional character in a comic book, commonly breaks the fourth wall, has conversations with his own internal monologues. He's queer, mentally ill, a rape victim, cancer patient. He kills without remorse. He never shuts up. No shade from me on that, Deadpool, because I've got a podcast I never shut up either. And he's an endearingly funny, unique anti-hero who was really ripe for his own movie for a long time. Deadpool's long-time relationship with Wolverine and Reynolds with Hugh Jackman is a pretty constant source of parody for the movie, but Deadpool was part of the same programme that created Wolverine. Both characters are Canadian, 
Lone Wolverine Deadpool joined the Weapon X program after being kicked out of the US Special Forces. His healing power is based on Wolverines. Artist and writer Rob Liefeld and writer Fabian Nicisa created the character purely based on these classic characters like Spider-Man and Wolverine. They wanted to make the brand new classic Marvel character. Liefeld came up with the character's name and visual design and Nicisa with how Deadpool spoke. And if you're wondering if the name Wade Wilson is in any way linked to DC's Deathstroke, Slade Wilson, apparently the characters are related. I mean, obviously that's kind of not true, but they did that on purpose to make it seem like the characters were related. Deadpool was designed to be the anti-Wolverine, the rejected version of Wolverine. The loudmouth Danny DeVito twin to Arnold Schwarzenegger's much more superior twin. I hopefully you get that reference because if you've not seen twins, then I mean, have you even lived if you've not seen twins? So Deadpool would have no filter. He would have no remorse. He would make his debut in The New Mutants, number 98, in February 1991 with somewhat of a fanfare. So introducing the lethal Deadpool was highlighted across the cover with Deadpool himself holding a huge smoking gun, and I mean huge, it's massive, as well as his trademark double katana. Despite a brief appearance in the issue, his quips and nonchalant behaviour made the character an immediate hit. So much so that fan mail for New Mutants number 98 increased by 500%, with three quarters of the mail wanting the character of Deadpool to return. So when the New Mutants rebranded to X-Force, Deadpool was given a meaty supporting role and also started appearing in other Marvel comics. Unlike every other character, Deadpool's speech bubbles were yellow instead of white to show how different he was. After Rob Liefeld's departure from Marvel a year later, Fabian the Caesar created a tragic backstory for Wade. He was an ordinary human working as a mercenary for hire who contracts cancer and enters the Weapon X program as a last chance to be cured. Weapon X gave him his mutant healing powers and cured the cancer, but in doing so scarred his whole body and left him mentally unstable. In 1993, Deadpool received his own miniseries, Deadpool the Circle Chase, which was written by Fabian Nicisa and penciled by Joe Maggiorera. Nicisa did not return for the follow-up miniseries, Deadpool Sins of the Past, in 1994, which was written by Mark Wade with art by Ian Churchill. By this point though, Deadpool was on the decline, Despite multiple appearances, the problem wasn't with the character, but Marvel itself. Uh, this is something that I've spoken about a few times on this podcast, that in the 90s, Marvel were really struggling. So the publisher had financially collapsed due to an industry-wide slump, and Marvel found itself facing bankruptcy. Amidst the chaos of Marvel literally falling down around him, Marvel editor Matt Idelson called Joe Kelly, a comic writer with barely any experience, to write a new ongoing series focusing on Deadpool. Kelly decided to go for broke on the character's sense of humour, focusing on the massive ridiculousness of his situation while not forgetting the pathos. The core idea for Deadpool literally being, he wants to be good, but he actually can't. That the universe would not allow Wade Wilson to do that one good thing, and in doing so become a character that people could actually root for. Joe Kelly's run between 1997 to 1999 is seen as the defining characterisation and mythos of Deadpool. Kelly would also introduce Blind Al and Ajax, obviously characters we're going to get in the movie, sorry, I mean Francis, as well as Sister Margaret School for Wayward Children, which is the bar and dispatch centre for mercenaries. When Joe Kelly left the character in 1999, Christopher Priest took over writing duties and gave Deadpool probably his most defining characteristic, his regular breaking of the fourth wall. Deadpool was actually going to be aware that he was in a comic book. And obviously this is something that not many other characters in comic books actually do. In December 2013, writer Jerry Duggan confirmed on Twitter that Deadpool was canonically pansexual. However, that tweet has since been deleted, with Fabian Nicisa stating that Deadpool is both no sex and all sexes, and the epitome of inclusive. So Deadpool is whatever sexual orientation he is, or isn't, at the time. Marvel had never confirmed this officially, however, but the fact that a mainstream superhero would ever allude to homoerotic thoughts is something that no other character does. Deadpool is completely unique when it comes to representation of canonically queer characters. There is no other character who is as open and representative and expressive as Deadpool is. 
And if you compare the character to someone like Batman or Spider-Man, for example, that would just not happen with those characters. So it's one of the many reasons why I think Deadpool is not only so popular, but also so refreshing as something completely new, completely different. Not afraid to talk about the bad language, not afraid to talk about violence, not afraid to do bad language or violence, and also not afraid to talk about sex. And we're going to come back to sex in a little bit. And I'm going to talk about sex in the most PG-13 way that I possibly can. But I want to talk about the history of the Deadpool movie, because this is one of the most interesting things. You have this really fascinating character with so many interesting personality traits and quips and the way he looks at life. And then you have this idea for a Deadpool film. So in 2000, Marvel struck a deal with Artisan Entertainment to produce films based on certain Marvel characters, one of which was Deadpool. Ryan Reynolds, a huge fan of the character, started talking to screenwriter David S. Goyer while they were both working on Blade Trinity in 2004 to potentially produce a Deadpool movie, with Reynolds wanting the lead role of Deadpool. It became somewhat of an obsession for Ryan Reynolds, who felt an affinity to the character, and while that movie never actually panned out, a seed was planted in the thoughts of quite a few individuals. So also in 2004, David Benioff was hired to write a script for what would become X-Men Origins Wolverine, based on the Weapon X storyline and Chris Claremont and Frank Miller's 1982 limited series on Wolverine. Benioff had envisaged an R-rated Wolverine story, including characters like Gambit, and with Hugh Jackman collaborating on the script. The previous attempt between David S. Goyer and Ryan Reynolds was known of due to Jeff Katz, who was VP of production at Fox. And circumstances being as they are, obviously, we know what happened to X-Men Origins Wolverine, but this felt like the ideal opportunity to introduce Deadpool. Jeff Katz knew that Ryan Reynolds was interested in the character, and also that he would be perfect as the character. But the problem with X-Men Origins Wolverine, and there were a lot of problems, and I did re-watch that for this episode, I wanted to re-watch it just to kind of get an idea remind myself of that version of Deadpool. I mean, it's not Deadpool, let's be honest, but the problem with X-Men Origins Wolverine, multiple, multiple, but what started as an R-rated revenge movie inevitably became X-Men 4. The decisions behind the scenes to change it to a more PG-13 movie, to have more CGI, to add more cast members basically meant that we ended up with a very different version of Deadpool. And so Ryan Reynolds was in a very difficult position because he didn't want to debut a character he loved in such a bastardised way. But Fox presented him with an ultimatum because they owned the character. And if Ryan Reynolds wanted to play him, which Ryan Reynolds really wanted to do, then he'd have to play him as depicted in X-Men Origins Wolverine. So Ryan Reynolds basically agreed to this extended cameo mid-movie as Wade Wilson, but never agreed with the decisions made thereafter. So never agreed with the decision to shut the character up and make him a literal Deadpool of all of these different mutant abilities. A post credit scene showing Deadpool surviving the events of X-Men Origins Wolverine and due to the additional success of the movie, Fox officially began development on a version of Deadpool. And Ryan Reynolds was actually attached to star in that movie. So this version would ignore the X-Men Origins Wolverine version of Deadpool and return to the character's comic book roots. Rhett Rees and Paul Wernick were hired in January 2010 to write the script of this movie. Robert Rodriguez was considered to direct, but he turned it down in October 2010. By April 2011, Tim Miller, a visual effects coordinator with no experience directing feature films, was brought onto the project and Ryan Reynolds additionally made a deal to produce. And then... So not only did we have X-Men Origins Wolverine, which was overall a disappointment, then Ryan Reynolds starred in Green Lantern. A movie that I have not seen in its entirety. (laughs) I have seen bits. I have not managed to finish Green Lantern. But I think it's safe to say that Green Lantern was an overwhelming disappointment in the DC universe. And this basically halted Deadpool. Because Fox started to question Ryan Reynolds' bankability 
and they were then concerned about making an R-rated movie. They discussed back and forth whether Deadpool could work as a PG-13 version, but it was basically decided it was either go big, go full R rating, or forget about it. So finally, after much discussion with Fox executives, with Tim Miller and with Ryan Reynolds, Tim Miller was given a small budget to produce some test footage. So this was produced in 2012, and it was basically to show what the movie could achieve if it were ever made. The CGI footage, which would be reproduced in the finished movie, the scene is called the 12 bullets fight. You'll know what that is because he uses 12 bullets. So this test footage shows Deadpool voiced by Ryan Reynolds jumping from the bridge to attack the goons in the car. I will pop a YouTube link in the show notes just in case you haven't seen it. And this test footage was shown to Fox, who buckled. And unsurprisingly, for a major film studio, decided not to green light Deadpool. So Deadpool was dead, basically. Deadpool was not going to happen. That May of 2012, The Avengers came out. It was released to huge financial and critical success. And so they came back to Deadpool. And they said, well, look at this movie. The Avengers is huge. But even that success couldn't convince Fox to green light Deadpool. So that was it. Deadpool was over. Fast forward two years. In July of 2014, the test footage was leaked online. And as soon as it was leaked online, fans went bananas. The support for Deadpool was overwhelming. They loved everything about this clip. They loved the tone and it represented everything fans wanted in a Deadpool movie. To this day, no one truly knows who leaked the footage. Could it have been Tim Miller? Could it have been Ryan Reynolds? Could it even have been the studio testing the water? It's kind of all a bit speculation. It is practically unheard of for a major film studio to do such a thing. The footage is raw, it's unpolished, and it's not the most marketable product in the world. While promoting Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds did suggest that he, Tim Miller, Rhett Reese, and Paul Wernick had discussed leaking the footage and that he was 70% sure that it wasn't him. So who knows? But anyway, it got leaked and the reaction was overwhelmingly positive. And less than two months later, September 2014, Fox finally officially greenlit Deadpool for a February 2016 release. It had a smaller than typical superhero movie budget, but most importantly, the production had complete free reign on the project. Fox actually ended up cutting the original budget by seven to eight million dollars. So they actually had less for what they were actually originally planning to do. So what this meant was that there was a costly gunfight planned at the end of the movie. You'll remember if you've seen Deadpool recently, he gets an entire arsenal of guns and he takes them in Dopinder's cab and they get to the helicarrier, which actually they wanted to try and link this movie to the Avengers in some way. And so they actually had a helicarrier at the end. They purposely designed it so it didn't look like an Avengers helicarrier, but it is supposed to be a helicarrier. So that fight at the end was supposed to be a massive gunfight. It got rewritten. So that is how they worked around it. The fact that Dopinda drove off with all of the guns is how they worked around the fact that they couldn't do this huge fight at the end. So it's successfully skirted around the budget issues. Deadpool is obviously set within the X-Men universe, but at an unspecified time. It would share characters and settings, but it would also stand independent of that universe, whether it be the Stuart or McAvoy timelines, because let's be honest, we never find out which one. It also includes characters regular fans of the X-Men movies would know of, Colossus was chosen as a good foil for Deadpool. And obviously Wolverine gets a fair few mentions too. Negasonic Teenage Warhead, well, she was primarily chosen for her name alone. Her powers in the comics weren't exactly what they wanted for the character because they actually wanted to make her a Teenage Warhead. Because they thought, well, this is a really cool name. If she's Negasonic Teenage Warhead, let's make her a Negasonic Teenage Warhead. But they didn't have the rights to do it. They had the rights to the character and the rights to the powers that she had. But they didn't have the rights to change those powers. So to do this, Fox and Marvel agreed to trade. Fox could have Negasonic Teenage Warhead and they could change her powers as they saw fit. And Marvel could take Ego the Living Planet away from Fox for the upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. And so that's how we got Kurt Russell in the MCU. So not only does Deadpool know he's in a movie, 
know who Hugh Jackman is and who Mama June is, although even I know that reference has aged considerably in five years. He also knows who Ryan Reynolds is and that Ryan Reynolds played Green Lantern as well as the X-Men Origins Wolverine Deadpool. And this Deadpool knows that Ryan Reynolds didn't get this far on his superior acting method. God's perfect idiot really is so perfect as Deadpool. It genuinely is like Deadpool has actually been playing Ryan Reynolds since the early 2000s. And Ryan Reynolds was so involved in the look of the character and remaining as faithful to the source material as possible, including the design of a comic accurate costume, which he openly wept when he first saw. That's how much this guy loves this character. He also kept one of the six versions of costume after shooting. His full body scar makeup took six hours to apply. He was also given a CGI penis as well, which is fascinating stuff. <laughs> the fact that <laughs> they, they think of these things. But anyway, the full makeup required nine silicon prosthetics to cover his head alone. By January 2015, TJ Miller and Ed Skrine had been confirmed as starring in the movie. Daniel Cudmore, who'd played Colossus in the previous X-Men movies, declined to return. And Fox were casting for Vanessa, with several actresses auditioning, including Taylor Schilling, Crystal Reed, Rebecca Rittenhouse, Sarah Green and Jessica DeGau. Marina Bakarin of Firefly and Serenity fame, done an episode on Serenity as well. That's episode 53, by the way. So she won the role of Vanessa. And one of the things I love so much about Deadpool, and Deadpool is refreshing in so many ways when it comes to superhero movies, but the thing that I love the most, I think, is the relationship between Wayne and Vanessa. And the reason why I think I like it so much is because sex isn't really talked about in Marvel movies. I have mentioned this before when I was talking about the Avengers and about the relationships depicted in the Avengers because the MCU as an entity is sexless. Even long-standing relationships like Cyclops and Jean in X-Men, for example, you never really see any real intimacy between these characters. You might get a chaste kiss, but that's kind of it. Marvel and sex just don't seem to mix. And then Deadpool comes along. And not only is Deadpool the first Marvel movie to show scenes of a sexual nature, it also fully embraces the sexuality of its characters. It has a fairly long and varied sex montage. Vanessa is a sex worker. and She's never shamed for that. Both she and Wade have kinks, which are also never shamed. Their relationship is full of carnal desire, but also healthy and funny, as well as romantic. And it's lovely. It's really, truly nice to see something like that depicted on screen because relationships are like that. It may not be everyone's idea of romance, but it works for those characters. I really, really like that about this movie, that it's free to be able to show sex in a more candid way that's not encroaching on porn levels, but enough to say that, yes, these characters have sex. And so do most Marvel characters. We just never see it because we're never allowed to see it. Deadpool is a love story. So when Deadpool tells us it's a love story, it is a love story. I, I don't think that most love stories start with murder, but it is about love. It's different versions of love and that you should basically embrace different versions of love. I really, really like that about Deadpool. I really genuinely do. It really does stand alone for me in, in so many ways, not just for the R rating, and obviously not just for the fact that you couldn't really have Deadpool without an R rating. But if you look at a movie like Logan, you can see how different movies rely on that R rating. And a movie like Logan wouldn't work with a very graphic sex montage. But a movie like Deadpool absolutely works with a really graphic sex montage. <laughs> but both of those movies are so brilliant individually. I think they prove that you don't have to have an R rating just for the sake of it. Like, the, the material has to warrant an R rating. Don't just slap an R rating on something and think, oh, well, people are going to see it because Deadpool worked and because Logan worked. Because it doesn't really work like that. It has to befit the character and the situation. But similarly, don't just stick a PG-13 rating on something. It has to be suited to what it is. You couldn't have a PG-13 Deadpool. You couldn't have a PG-13 Logan. They are supposed to be graphic in their own individual ways. But, yeah, I, I can't praise Deadpool enough. Not only for the fact it was made in the first place, but the fact that they took so many risks. So many risks. In the superhero cinema genre, 
And it made it paid off in buckets. I'll come back to obviously financials and stuff, but it really, really paid off. I'm so glad that it did because superhero cinema needs to take more risks. Superhero cinema needs more Deadpools and more Logans. It needs a varied plethora of characters and situations. Anyway, enough of my rant about superhero cinema because as much as I love the MCU and obviously Deadpool is going to be canonically MCU going forward, I really do think that this is an incredibly special movie that's mostly forgotten now. When you think of superhero cinema, you don't think of Deadpool. But I think people should think of Deadpool because Deadpool really is completely standalone and unique. And I'm, I'm not even counting the sequel. Deadpool 2 was always going to be successful, purely based on Deadpool. Um, <laughs> so the visual effects in Deadpool. So they were completed by Weta Digital, Digital Domain, Blur Studio, who also worked on the test footage as well, Luma Pictures, Atomic Fiction and Rodeo FX. The intention was, as I said, that was a very tiny budget for this movie. They wanted to keep the budget as lean as possible. So the movie was edited before visual effects were added to avoid spending unnecessary money. Deadpool contains 1,500 effects shots, 700 more than originally planned, with 800 of those completed in the last four weeks of production. Digital Domain were responsible for creating the CG model of Deadpool that was used for all FX vendors and animated Deadpool's eyes to be more comic accurate and expressive. And the FX vendors, well, there was a little friendly rivalry going on. They didn't want to be outshone by each other. And when Luma contributed, the, contributed to the film's blood and gore by mixing practical footage with digital blood effects, Digital Domain animated buckets of blood when Deadpool cuts off his own hand. Luma created the new baby hand and Digital Domain studied 20 to 30 different versions of broken fingers. One of the most remarkable things really about this movie, and I, I've already mentioned it several times, alluded to it at least, is that Fox truly went all in and truly embraced the vision of Deadpool, proving that the least studio meddling on a project, the better that project will be, especially, and probably really only, when you have talented, passionate people who really, truly care about the character, about his, about his authenticity and the fans as well. Because this is a character who has very passionate fans. Pleasing the fan base is really, really important to get people on the side of this movie. It is remarkable that Deadpool even exists, but that it exists as it is, and it's as good as it is, and refreshingly brutal and honest about this character's life and personality, the fact that it's riddled with bad language, none of which I can repeat, sex and violence, makes it such an anomaly in superhero cinema. This movie deserves your ultimate respect, genuinely. Even Ryan Reynolds deserves ultimate respect for this movie. He adores this character. You can tell how much he loves Deadpool. He even stepped in when Fox refused to fund the writer's set visits. So Ryan Reynolds was adamant that Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick were involved in the production of the movie because they wrote the movie. It was important that they were on set, but Fox refused to pay to get them to visit. So Ryan Reynolds paid for them both out of his own pocket. You can berate Ryan Reynolds, I think, and a lot of people do. And to be honest, he takes the mick out of himself more than anyone takes the mick out of him. Yeah, he did play a character that wore a CGI super suit. He deserves to be berated for that. But Ryan Reynolds really also is the gift that keeps on giving, especially when it comes to this character. He's really, truly found his niche. I don't want to see him as anything else. I just want him as Deadpool. If all he does is play Deadpool for the rest of his life, I am more than happy with that. Speaking of Ryan Reynolds, I have to move on to a fellow Canadian because... I have to now try and link this movie for the obligatory Keanu reference to Keanu Reeves. It's very hard for me to link Keanu to any superhero. There are lots of clickbait articles online about Keanu playing Ghost Rider and Ghost Rider and Deadpool teaming up in a movie and it's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. I try not to reference those because they are just clickbait. They're just clickbait. But really, the only way I can link is... Canada. So Keanu's Canadian, Ryan Reynolds is Canadian, Deadpool is Canadian. So there's no better reference than the great country of Canada. And a massive hi and hello, as always, to the wonderful 
Canadian listeners. Just know how much I love your country and the people that are from it. So Tom Holkenberg composed the score for Deadpool. He used 1980s sounds to complement Deadpool's preference for Wham specifically. Also included on the soundtrack is Salt and Pepper's Sheep, which is a tune, as well as DMX's X Gone Give It To You, which is also an absolute bop. Another completely genius move for Deadpool, given its very limited budget, was the marketing for the movie. So if they had a very small marketing budget. And so what they decided to do was Ryan Reynolds again actual superhero of this story, Ryan Reynolds, worked closely with Fox domestic marketing chief Mark Weinstock to utilise cheaper methods of promoting this movie in a way that Deadpool himself would use. So I mentioned that Ryan Reynolds kept an outfit and he used that costume for promotional purposes and they basically utilised ideas. So they did things like the 12 Days of Deadpool, where a new feature or poster or image was released every day up until Christmas Day 2015. Reynolds as Deadpool interacted with children dressed as X-Men for Halloween. Public service announcement parodies were recorded for holidays like Chinese New Year, obviously, as well as slightly more serious topics such as Deadpool instructing men how to check for testicular cancer, because let's be honest, there is a very serious backstory behind the character of Deadpool, the fact that Wade Wilson is diagnosed with cancer. And so makes complete sense that Deadpool would tell guys how to check for cancer. The certain posters for the film, which was due out just before Valentine's Day, sold it as essentially a rom-com, as a love story for the ages, which it really is, by the way. I am so invested in Wade and Vanessa. It is a love story for all time, just perhaps not for all ages. Um, and Ryan Reynolds was incredibly active on social media and he utilised his friendship with Hugh Jackman as well to great effect. They took part in a faux rivalry with each other. They used Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Tinder, even Pornhub. So social media helped sell the movie better than a traditional marketing campaign ever could. And after early screenings, 90,000 tweets a day were mentioning Deadpool. Fox's willingness to utilise Reynolds and run with his ideas meant that the marketing was honest, relatable, and like Deadpool himself, completely relentless. Deadpool was everywhere in the late 2015, 2016, because Ryan Reynolds was so on this character. Deadpool's world premiere was held at the Grand Rex in Paris on the 8th of February, 2016. It released wide in the US on the 12th of February, 2016, where it hit number one in the box office stayed there for three weeks until being dethroned by Zootopia and London has fallen by falling to third place. I mentioned financials a little bit earlier. So Deadpool's budget was quite paltry for a superhero movie of just $58 million. Deadpool was expected to earn 55 to $60 million in its opening weekend. It ended up making $152.2 million over the long President's Day weekend. Deadpool would end up grossing $783.1 million worldwide, breaking numerous records, including becoming the highest grossing X-Men film, the ninth highest grossing film of 2016, and the second most profitable release of 2016. This was all despite not being released in China, who denied a release due to the graphic violence. However, Deadpool did premiere at the Beijing International Film Festival in 2018, completely unedited which again, barely heard of for the Chinese market. It was the highest grossing R-rated movie ever on its release in 2016. It's since been surpassed by its own sequel in 2018 and then Joker in 2019. Deadpool was also nominated for 62 awards, winning 15 of them. It was considered a serious contender for the Academy Awards after being nominated for Golden Globes, Critics' Choice and Writers Guild of America Awards. Those Oscar nominations didn't happen though, mainly because the Academy is always biased against superhero movies. And additionally, Fox actively didn't campaign for the movie either. Sequel-wise, Deadpool 2 followed in 2018, introduced some new characters such as Domino and Cable, and then Disney acquired Fox. So Deadpool's entry into the MCU is now canon. It was announced by Kevin Feige. Deadpool 3 has been confirmed as retaining its R rating, making it potentially the first R-rated entry into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's going to be very, very interesting to see what Marvel do with this character, 
how they treat this character. I feel like with Ryan Reynolds on board, I feel confident that they will know what to do with Deadpool. I was a little bit underwhelmed by Deadpool 2, to be completely honest. But I think the possibility for Deadpool 3 actually in the Marvel Universe is really, really fascinating. I'm really excited for Deadpool 3. It's probably not going to come out for a few years at the very least because Marvel have not announced it officially. But yeah, I feel like Deadpool 3 is probably going to be a lot of fun. Right. So we're going to move over to listener thoughts. We're going to start with the patrons because we always start with the patrons. And honestly, I really do feel like Andy has excelled himself with this comment. I'm so impressed with you, Andy. This might be your greatest comment ever. I feel like I'm not going to do this justice. But listeners, this is really impressive. So Andy says. Okay, 12 bullet points. Let's count them down. 12. Acknowledging how horribly they dropped the ball with Deadpool in X-Men Origins Wolverine added to the comedy. 11. I think that came with a reference to Ryan Reynolds' green lantern failure was such a stroke of genius. 10. Giving us the Colossus that we've been waiting for since 2000. 9. Utilising the R rating to crank up the volume on the language and violence, which gave us the truer version of the comics character, instead of using the rating to just make him darker. 8 to 7. Bad Andy. 6. Good Andy. Five, an amazing supporting cast, including the always welcome and often underutilised Marina Bakarin. Four, taking the superhero movie tropes and not turning them into lazy jokes. Three, this is still Junkie XL's best comic book movie score. Two, have I mentioned they were wise to give Ryan Reynolds the run of this film to just do all the Deadpool things we wanted. One, are you still here? What are you waiting for? The movie's over. Go home. Kudos to you, Captain. Sorry, Deadpool. And, I mean, come on. <laughs> Literally best comment ever. You win. You win comments, Andy. I like to give a bit of a shout out to my patient. I'm definitely going to give a shout out to Andy for that. If you want such similarly brilliant, witty banter on your podcast, then you need to check out his podcast, Geek Salad. They are a literal one-stop shop for all of your geeky podcast needs. So movies, music, TV, games, literally anything. Go and check out Geek Salad. Go and check it out just for that comment alone. I mean, come on, that was just, oh, chef's kiss. Andy, so proud of you. And another patron comment from Derek, who says, It's a strange, bizarre, funny affair. While I could argue it's superhero deconstructionism is rather cynical, I do think that's the point. If there is a deeper meaning, it's that there is no deeper meaning and love. Derek, along with his amazing wife Laurel, they host the podcast The Midnight Myth. So I'm going to give them a bit of a plug as well. They are one of my favourite podcasts. They talk about history, mythology, philosophy, and basically how those topics relate to modern cinema and pop culture. They recently had a baby as well. Baby Arthur is, I think, six months old now and just so beautiful and so lovely. Uh, Derek and Laurel often post pictures on Twitter and he's just a beautiful baby. But anyway, links for The Midnight Myth are in the show notes, along with Geek Salad links as well. We have another patron comment from Dan, who says, This is Ryan Reynolds' magnum opus, the role that he was born to play. He perfectly carries the movie alone, while simultaneously playing off the supporting characters and the combination of violence mixed with crass humour hit all the right notes. And we have another one from Brendan who says, Deadpool does the magic trick of taking a star perfectly suited to the comedy of the character and a refreshing meta approach to the tropes it still cheekily indulges in and combining them with genuine emotion and an audience investment behind the jokes, the violence and swears. And a huge thank you to all of the patrons, as always, for giving your comments. We're going to move over to Twitter. And there's only a couple of comments on Twitter. But we have at oral underscore MFC who says, I wish they'd cast someone to provide a voiceover for the other voice in Deadpool's head. He has white and yellow commentary thought boxes in the comic representing his fragmented mind. Other than that, I really have no complaints on this adaptation of the character. And at Kirsty Bennett 8 said, Oh, I love it. It and he are hilarious. Ryan Reynolds is perfectly cast as Deadpool and it's great to see some of the other X-Men as well. No comments on Instagram or Facebook, but that is kind of a bit par for the course uh, a lot of the time. But as always, a huge thank you to everyone who did take the time to give your comments on Deadpool. I feel like 
like I've not stressed enough how much I loved Edpool. Do you think, do I need to say it again? Uh, cause I will. It's really hard to remember a time when R-rated superhero movies weren't a thing. So we had Deadpool in 2016, we had Logan in 2017. Both were so appropriate for the R ratings that they got. Never felt like an R rating for the sake of giving an R rating. And you know how much I love Logan. I cried on that episode. I mean, I only cry on certain episodes, but I really got emotional for Logan. Deadpool broke the mould, really, for superhero cinema. It's unique for being so different to everything else in its genre that Fox, in their willingness to take risks, actually proved that an R-rated superhero comedy works if you have the right character, the right tonal balance between the comedy, the sex, bad language and violence, the ability to actually laugh at the ridiculousness of superhero cinema, and also the right people behind the scenes. Ryan Reynolds is not an actor that anyone would loud with Lord as the next Hugh Jackman, but he's proven how inimitable and irreplaceable he is as Deadpool. It is a role that he really was born to play, and it's a role that still feels completely fresh and genre-defining five years after it's released. Find someone who's crazy matches your crazy, because Ryan Reynolds' crazy definitely matches with Deadpool's, and it's wonderful. Thank you for listening. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on Deadpool. If you did enjoy this episode, you can help Verbal Diorama grow and be noticed by doing one of the following things. You could leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. You could retweet or like posts on social media, or you could just tell a friend or a family member that you've heard this brilliant podcast and you really want them to listen to. And if you do like this episode on Deadpool, you might also like the following episodes. So... I've covered quite a lot of superhero cinema over the 100, now 100 plus episodes of Verbal Diorama. But I'm not going to recommend every single superhero movie that I've ever covered because I feel like that would be completely pointless. But what I am going to do is I am going to recommend certain episodes that I really do think complement Deadpool. And Deadpool is very unique. It's not really like anything else that exists before it. But... I am going to recommend episode 23, which is an episode that I did on the movie Mystery Men. Now, Mystery Men is trying to do something very similar to Deadpool. It's basically trying to satirise superhero cinema. The problem with Mystery Men was Mystery Men came out probably like 10 to 15 years too early. People didn't appreciate Mystery Men at the time. And if you are interested, Mystery Men also features a guest appearance from the aforementioned Andy from Geek Salad. So, I mean, it's definitely worth your time for that because I always love chatting to Andy. But Mystery Men is absolutely 100% worth your time and you should definitely check out that movie, especially if you enjoy Deadpool. You should also check out episode 19, which is Logan. Logan is a movie that is obviously very totally different to Deadpool, but again, just utilises that R rating so beautifully. Hugh Jackman is phenomenal in that movie. Hugh Jackman is perfectly cast as Wolverine, just as Ryan Reynolds is perfectly cast as Deadpool. I would have absolutely adored to see Deadpool and Wolverine together. Obviously, Hugh Jackman's more or less retired from the role now, so it's unlikely we would ever see that, but I still have my fingers crossed for something with Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds working together as these characters, because... That would really be a dream come true, honestly. So absolutely check out Logan. Episode 56, which is on the original X-Men movie. I have kind of covered X-Men movies a bit out of whack, really, because I did X-Men Dark Phoenix first, then I did Logan, and then I did the original X-Men. So, but absolutely check out that episode because it is really fascinating where the X-Men franchise actually started. And obviously that's the Stuart timeline. And then, obviously, if you do want to go all the way back to episode 11, which is X-Men Dark Phoenix, that is the McAvoy timeline. I am planning to do more of the McAvoy timeline. I'm also planning to do more of the Stuart timeline. But I think I need to stay away from superhero cinema now. But I would absolutely recommend all of those things. As always, give me feedback on my episode recommendations. Do you think I got them right? Let me know. So the next episode... It's actually something that I watched quite recently. Again, I've not seen it that many times before. I think I've only ever seen it once before. But someone was talking about it on social media and I thought to myself, I'm going to get a copy of that. And so me being me, I just randomly bought a copy of this movie and sat down and watched it. 
really loved it, genuinely adored it. And it's a Michael J. Fox movie. Michael J. Fox was probably one of my favourite actors growing up. And that was mainly because of Back to the Future. This is not Back to the Future, I'm sorry to say. I'm saving that for a big episode down the line. Um, it's actually The Frighteners. The Frighteners was Michael J. Fox's last major leading role. Live action, of course. He, ha he did do animated roles after that. But The Frighteners has always fascinated me. So it's the first appearance of Michael J. Fox on Verbal Diorama. Not the last at all. It's also the first directorial appearance of Peter Jackson. Also not the last. I'm really excited to talk about The Frighteners. Because I think it's a real gem of a movie. I think it's really underrated. So come back for episode 103 on The Frighteners. If you want to follow me on social media, you can do so. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and Letterboxd at Verbal Diorama. And if you want to support the show financially, you can do so. You will get early episodes. You can get exclusive episodes as well. It's verbaldiorama.com slash Patreon. And as always, a huge thank you to the patrons of Verbal Diorama. Some of these guys have supported me since December 2019. I'm so grateful to them for their support. So huge thanks to Simon E, Sade, Hardy L, Claudia, Simon B, Laurel, Derek, Jason, Kristin, Kat, Andy, Mike, Griff, Luke, Emily, Michael, Scott, Mark, Brendan, Ian, Lisa, Dan, and Sam. It's time to make the chibi f***ing changas. You can also check out my merch store if you want, verbaldiorama.com slash merch. You can email me, general hellos, feedback or suggestions, verbaldiorama at gmail.com. You can also pop over to my website, verbaldiorama.com as well. And as always, you can pop over to filmstories.co.uk. You can check out the magazine, which I write for. You can check out articles online, which I also write. And basically, just support independent publications. Please, please, please. And finally... So you're going to do a superhero landing. Wait for it. Woo! Superhero landing. Yeah, that's really hard on your knees. Totally impractical. They all do it. You're a lovely lady, but I'm saving myself for Francis. Bye.